A couple quick announcements, however, in the cases where we don't get recordings posted, or I don't manage to record them for reasons that are still beyond me, um, I will try and link to previous lectures that have already been recorded. And those will be similar, um, but not quite identical to what I've talked about here. So that's the sort of the main thing. Oh, the second one was, yes, I try and post the lecture notes the night before by 10. I had them perfectly prepared, and I forgot to upload them. So um, they were uploaded about 7 o'clock this morning. But yeah, so we talked a little bit about mutations. We'll talk more about mutations today, particularly in terms of DNA repair. Um, Semi-conservative replication, semi-discontinuous replication. Hopefully that is very clear to everyone now. Um, and how that actually works, the replication mechanism, it's all about the DNA polymerase, at least in terms of replication. It's got the two activities. One is the polymerization activity. One is the proofreading activity. Um, and the fidelity, i.e. how few mistakes you make, come from both the checking of the structure of the DNA. And again, DNA structure is going to be something that will be very important when we talk about DNA repair later on, because some things are base specific, but a lot of things are actually structure specific in terms of how you get DNA repair to take place. Um, we talked a little bit about the replication fork. We'll talk more about the replication fork. The main thing I wanted to remind you of there is that it's not just the DNA polymerase. We've got helicases. We've got single-stranded binding proteins. We've got sliding clamps. We've got clamp loaders. We've got all kinds of extra proteins that are involved in replication forks. Um, and that whole process, replisome, where we have everything that has come together. Today we'll talk a little bit about supercoiling. Um, and I also realized that I forgot my bag of helices. Um, I'll bring those on Friday. Kind of weird having, you know, yesterday being a bizarre snow day. Um, I stayed home with my kids. Um, and supercoiling is really uh, the point that DNA and the two strands are wrapped around each other. That's great um, and wonderful because it sort of you know, helps all the base pairs stay together. But as soon as you start to pull them apart, as soon as you're unwinding things that are wrapped around each other and making them linear, that unwinding's got to go somewhere. And that's what supercoiling uh, happens. To deal with supercoiling, you need topoisomerases. And topoisomerases change topology. And I know at least one of you probably knows more about topology than me, but that's uh, probably an exception to some extent. Um, so the whole idea here is topoisomerase has changed the topology of DNA, and that is literally okay, changing so, the see, now wrapping state uh, our or DNA the oh, supercoiling oh, state screen down. of the see? DNA. So we'll Technology. talk about those a little bit. Then we'll talk about what happens see. at the Best ends laid plans of, of chromosomes and or of Stedman, as the case may be. is really obvious. When you've got primers and you get rid of primers, then... You have a problem when you get to the ends. So that's an issue you have to deal with, particularly with linear chromosomes like we have. Um, then we'll go to the other end. We'll talk about origins. And then, yeah, start to talk about DNA repair. More questions at this point. Questions, comments, worries. OK, good. So I can ask you one, right? Which of the following has primer removing activity in E. coli? DNA helicase, clamp loader, sliding clamp, DNA primase, or DNA polymerase? We do not have consensus, so talk amongst yourselves, and I'll go get a drink of water.
Yeah? Happy? Let's go again. Okay, feel free to continue to discuss what you think the answer is. So. Okay, what do we think? DNA polymerase. Why would this be a different answer if it were in eukaryotes? Because the DNA polymerases in eukaryotes do not have the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity for getting rid of primers. It's only DNA polymerase 1 in E. coli that does this. Um, the other ones don't have any activity. So um, key here is that it's in E. coli. Um, of course, none of these other guys have any primer removing activity in eukaryotes either. There's something we'll talk about in just a second that has that other activity. What's the answer you were looking for that's not on here? RNase H, exactly. That's what you is, expect and is that fact doing in, the, the, in most of the cases, but this is what has some of that primer removing activity. Okay, so <clears throat> I promised I'd talk a little bit about supercoiling. Basic messages, again, I mentioned right at the beginning, those of you who just got here. As soon as you pull apart things that are wrapped around each other, unless the other end is free to spin around, you're going to start generating tension. And the way that tension is dealt with is you generate these supercoils. And so it's literally, and you know, one of the ways I do this, you have a piece of rope or a piece of yarn, hold, um, tape one end to something and pull the strands apart. What you'll find is the rest of it starts to wrap around itself. Um, and that's exactly what happens with DNA. So replication generates supercoils. Um, this is a problem because the more supercoils you get, the more stress you have in your DNA. And it actually will stop the progression of polymerases. And people have done experiments where you can see this. If you stop getting rid of supercoils, the polymerases will stop. So this is a serious problem, and you have to deal with it. Of course, biology has come up with ways to dealing with this. And there are actually two different ways of dealing with these kinds of supercoiling issues. Again, very creatively named, topoisomerase 1 and topoisomerase 2. Um, there are actually classes of topoisomerases. There are lots of different ones in each of these two different classes. But as far as we're concerned, topoisomerase 1, topoisomerase 2. Easiest way to remember, topoisomerase 1 cuts one strand, topoisomerase 2 cut two strands. So topoisomerase 1, what it does is it has a tyrosine in the middle of the active site of the enzyme. Tyrosine is really nice because it's got an OH. OHs, of course, look a lot like 3' OHs that you have in DNA. So that OH pretends that it's a 3' OH and will bind to a phosphate. Then this DNA, one strand, is free to rotate relative to the other strand. Then once this rotation has happened, this reaction can reverse instead of being bound to your tyrosine as it is here, the OH, which is on your nucleotide, will bind back to that phosphate, and you have a repaired DNA that has lost a supercoil. The energy that comes, or is needed for this reaction, is actually the energy which is stored up in that overwound DNA. So that overwound DNA, as soon as you make that cut, it will go back and then re-ligate. So this does not require any extra energy input. So another difference between topo-1s and topo-2s. Topo-1s, 
Cut one strand, don't need any ATP hydrolysis. On the other hand, topoisomerase twos cut both strands of DNA and do need ATP hydrolysis. Now, it's cutting two strands of DNA is kind of dangerous because if you cut the DNA, you don't want it to be flying off and then potentially interacting with another piece of DNA. And at the end of today or on Friday, we'll talk a lot about how double-stranded breaks get repaired. And double-stranded breaks are a really big problem as far as DNA is concerned. So it's very important if you have a topoisomerase 2 that you hang on to those cut strands of DNA and don't let them flop around or fly away. And so that's what's diagrammed here. Topo 2 actually has two, not actually three separate DNA binding domains, one which will bind a helix which is going to be passed through this helix, the other one which binds to the helix which will be cut, and then another binding site on the other side. So binds to DNA, cuts a double strand here, hangs onto them, passes this one through, and hooks them back together. Um, what I'm not going to spend any time talking about is that as far as supercoiling is concerned, these are absolutely equivalent to each other. Something called twist versus writhe, and I'm not, again, I'm not going to get into this. But uh, cutting one strand and wrapping it around the other is equivalent to taking two strands and passing it through another strand. So both of these are good ways to deal with the problems that you have as soon as you try and pull two strands apart. This process here of, of the topo twos, yeah. So um, what's happening here is you have two double strands of DNA. And maybe it's a little easier to back up and look here. This is what you have in this case right here. So you see these, these are double strands that have crossed over each other. So now the topo isomerase two will bind to this, chop one of those double strands, push this double strand through, and now you end up putting these two back together. Does that yeah. make more sense and slightly a different way of looking at it as well, different image? Okay, other questions? Uh, so you want a negative supercoil instead of a positive one? Okay, so <laughs> negative supercoiling versus positively supercoiling. Um, so I didn't want to get in too much into this, but you brought it up, so now I have the excuse to. Um, negative supercoiling versus positive supercoiling. That's all relative to 10 base pairs per turn. So every time you have double-stranded DNA B form, 10 base pairs. If you have less than 10 base pairs, one turn less, that's negative, more it's going to be positively supercoiled. And that is also the twist, which is the wrapping around, is transformable to the writhe. And when I bring my models, we can look at this on Friday as well, what that difference is. But writhe is those two strands crossing over each other, and twist is wrapping around each other. And positive is just defined by more of the twist in the same direction that you have, and negative of less. Now, there is an advantage with that, and there's a reason to talk about negative versus positive supercoiling. Why is negative better? If you think about negative, it's untwisting your DNA. Untwisting your DNA is really good if that's what you're trying to do in the first place. You're trying to do replication. Untwisted is good. Negatively supercoiled is good. It makes it easier to pull those two strands apart. Positively supercoiled makes it harder to do that. Make more sense, or you're more confused? OK, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't going to bring it up, but no, you did. So um, <clears throat> I've talked about it a lot in the past. So uh, that brings me to, unfortunately, alphabet soup. And I'll try, and I think I have a slide somewhere which has this um, description. Eukaryotic replication forks versus bacterial replication forks. So far, we just talked about sliding clamps, clamp loaders, primases, et cetera, in bacteria. You need all the same activities in eukaryotes, but just to make things fun and interesting, they all have different names. So um, just wanted to go over those really briefly here. Um, first one, the helicase. 
Um, DNA helicase, you've got to separate the two strands. Again, same thing, bacteria, eukaryotes. Here, actually in this older version of a textbook, it's listed as being T antigen. T antigen is absolutely incorrect. Uh, that's, in fact, a viral protein, um, which is how they discovered this helicase in the first place. It's actually called the MCM protein or the GINS protein, MCM for mini chromosome maintenance. So that's your helicase. RPA, replication protein A, is a single-stranded binding protein. RFC, replication factor C, is the clamp loader. We talked about PCNA last time. Somebody asked me, you know, what's proliferating cell nuclear antigen? So the sliding clamp. And if you remember from last time at the animation we looked at right at the end, you'll notice that that lagging strand had lots of sliding clamps associated with it. So the PCNA is actually one of the more common proteins that you find in replicating cells because it's hanging out all along the lagging strand. You then also have polymerases. And this actually should be polymerase delta and polymerase epsilon. The equivalent of this in E. coli is DNA polymerase 3, the one which is doing the extensions. There is, unfortunately, at least for trying to remember these things, uh, no equivalent of DNA polymerase 1. And that was what I sort of mentioned in the clicker question. There's no DNA polymerase that has 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity. What there is, is something called Paul alpha and Paul alpha is really basically the DNA primase. There's actually two separate molecules here. It's a DNA polymerase and a primase. The primase, just like we talked about in E. coli, is an RNA polymerase, so it makes an RNA primer. So Paul alpha primase, but these all guys always sit together, and they will make your primer. After that primer is made, of course, you have your replicative polymerase that can come down and extend it. The other difference, because we don't have a DNA polymerase 1 that can chew up primers, we need another way to deal with them. One of them is RNAsH, which is identical. It cleaves up RNAs in RNA-DNA hybrids. But then there's this extra protein that doesn't exist in bacteria called FEN1, the flap endonuclease. So what's the flap? The flap is the RNA of the primer, which gets cut off. So the endonuclease will cut into that flapped piece of primer in order to get rid of it, and then you need a DNA ligase to reassemble things. But otherwise, again, other than terminology, the only two differences are you have a DNA polymerase that's associated with the primase and you have the flap endonuclease. Otherwise, all the activities are the same, the names are different. And again, I will try and have a, a figure that sort of you know, has a table with all of these different things in it. Um, had that before. Okay, more questions about eukaryotic replication, et cetera. No, not a clear question yet. We'll get there. <clears throat> so we had some questions when we talked about chromatin modification. What happens to histones after replication? So here's an image from a different textbook. Um, we have our replication fork, PCNA, again, proliferating cell nucleantigen, replicating along. This is your non-replicated DNA. This is going to be your leading strand and your lagging strand here. As the replication fork moves through here, these histones are dissociated and then they get reassociated back with the DNA after the replication fork. Well, you'll notice H3 and H4 almost always stay together, and H2A and H2B are often exchanged. And that's supposed to be being shown here by the, the dark colors, which are the old histones, and the light colors, which are your new histones. But H3 and H4 always stay together, and H2A and H2B often get exchanged. Uh, these are put on by the histone chaperones, um, CAF1 and NAP1, the names here are not important, but they're chaperones that are also associated with PCNA. So mention that PCNA serves as a sliding clamp, but also people talk about PCNA as being sort of the molecular tool belt for replication. Um, interacts with all kinds of other different proteins, including these 
histone chaperones, but also interact with primase, um, et cetera. And um, turns out they actually also even interact with some of the replicative helicases as well. So that's what happens to histones. H3 and H4 generally stay together. H2A and H2B get exchanged. But because they're staying associated with the DNA after replication has gone through, these will still have those covalent modifications that have been added to them. So for instance, histone H3, lysine 9 will be methylated. So if it's methylated, then that will interact with histone code reader proteins that will interact with histone code writer proteins, which will then methylate the new histones that haven't been modified yet. So after replication, you still keep the same histone modifications because of these feedback loops. Okay, so that's replication. Now we have two issues to talk about. The, the end and the beginning. I'm going to start talking about the end and then we'll go back and talk about the beginning. So what's the end problem? Um, the end problem is because we have DNA polymerases that can't start by themselves. They all need primers. If you have to have a primer and you have to get rid of that primer, you're always going to have problems. The easiest way to deal with that problem is what most bacteria and archaea have figured out is, pardon me, um, don't have an end. Just be circular. If you're circular, these guys will replicate their way around to the end of the chromosome, end up at the other end. Your DNA polymerase 1 or RNase H will get rid of the primer. You don't have a problem. If, however, you have a linear chromosome, if you replicate linear chromosomes, you have a leading strand, this will go all the way to the end, but your lagging strand is going to have a little primer at the beginning that gets chewed off. And actually, your leading strand will have a primer here, which will get potentially chewed off as well. So always there's going to be a little piece at the end of your genome which is missing when you used to have your primer. So this is a problem because after you now separate these strands, you replicate this DNA, it's going to be shorter. And the next time you do replication, it's going to be shorter still, and shorter still, and shorter still. So this is a major problem if you have linear chromosomes. One way you can deal with it, and the smart virus has figured this out, is to not use an RNA primer, use protein priming. Take my virology course next term, we'll talk a lot about how protein priming works. Um, or you invent a telomerase. Um, and one thing I did want to mention here, sort of at the bottom, that's why I have these slides to remind myself to talk about these things, is this reduction of the length of chromosomes does seem to be important for aging in some cells. So the shorter and shorter your, the ends of your chromosomes get, eventually they will lead to a point that that cell can no longer replicate. And so it's definitely true in terms of the numbers of times that cells can replicate. Whether it's also important for aging of whole organisms is a very interesting and open question, and people, of course, are very interested in, in what's going on with that. So how do you deal with these ends, particularly in cells that have to replicate all of the time? This is a protein called telomerase. And so instead of actually chopping things up, as most enzymes do, this actually makes telomeres. And telomeres are literally just repeated sequences that get added to the ends of linear chromosomes. And what does the adding? Does the adding is the telomerase enzyme. Telomerase enzyme is a really fascinating enzyme for a couple of different reasons. One, it's a reverse transcriptase, so it means it uses an RNA template to make DNA. And the second thing is that the telomerase actually has an RNA that's associated with the enzyme permanently. So it's a reverse transcriptase that has the RNA template to make DNA with that it brings along with it. And so that's what's show, supposed to be shown down here. Part of the RNA that's in the telomerase serves as the template. This reverse transcriptase you literally will find a three prime end here, extend it, translocate, find the three prime end, extend it, and translocate. 
What this does is it extends one of the two strands. Now, not both of the two strands, just one of the two strands, where that 3 prime OH is. That gets extended, and then you have replication by the normal replication machinery, which will fill in that opposite strand. And that's what's shown here. So on this side, here we have our telomerase. Here we have the RNA, which is in the telomerase itself. This is a very specific sequence in the RNA. Again, it's, this is the template which is carried by the telomerase. In this case, 5 prime A, C, 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 <coughs> C, A, which will generate T, T, G, 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 T, T. And you see all these repeats are generated here on your strand, which otherwise is missing where there was a primer before. The telomerase will make multiple copies. And my pointer has died. Oh, not, not yet. Tried to die. Keeps trying to die on me. Technology. What a wonderful thing. Uh, <clears throat> so it extends here and makes literally hundreds of copies of this exact sequence. So all of these are now one nice, long, single-stranded piece of DNA, which serves a template for your DNA primase, DNA polymerase, which will extend here. Polymer, uh, the telomerase makes more copies. The polymerase, or primase and polymerase, will fill in. You're always going to have a little bit at the end, which is not paired. It's still single-stranded. That then can base pair to these sequences over here. This is a repeated sequence. What that does is generate these things called T loops. So the T loop is here. All of this is double-stranded DNA down to this little tiny piece at the end here, which is going to be base paired back to one of these repeated sequences, which you had right here at the beginning. This is actually shown a little bit better here in a more recent update. This has also all of the other proteins that are involved here. You don't need to know any of them. Uh, but this is that T-loop structure. You have little piece of DNA here, which is your regular DNA. Here's that single-stranded piece, the blue one, which extends just enough to base pair right here with this otherwise repeated sequence that, again, this is what the telomerase has made. So these are what T-loop structures look like, and again, lots of other proteins that are associated with them. Okay, questions on telomeres, telomerase. Yeah? Okay, well, I'm sorry, it's because my pointer died. <laughs> so right down here at the bottom. Yeah, no, this is, I, I need to complain about my pointer. <laughs> Hopefully the recording, however, is still working. It seems to be. <laughs> I have a backup recording here, too. So, okay, other questions on telomeres, telomerases? What does that mean? He's going to ask you a clicker question. <laughs> was it a groan, was it? Um, <laughs> if a telomeric sequence is 5 prime, I say telomeric, it's a telomeric RNA sequence, C-A-G-G-C, um, and that's, sorry, the telomeric sequence in your DNA is C-A-G-G-C, repeated multiple times. The sequence of the telomerase RNA must contain which are the following? C-A-G-G-C, G-C-C-T-G, G-C-C-U-G, G-U-C-C-G, G-A-T-A-T-C. So, might help to write this down if you've got a writing implement. We've got lots of differences of opinion here, so uh, to start start chatting about it, I'll give you a little bit more time.
Sorry. Okay, let's go again. Yes? Good. Ten, five, still not a hundred percent, but getting close. So, why a U? Because RNA, not DNA. So that brings you down to C and D immediately, and then all it is is just the opposite strand. So. 5 prime to 3 prime, 3 prime to 5 prime. They're always going to be in opposite orientations. So yes, it is C. Okay. If you're more interested in telomeres, which are absolutely fascinating and wonderful and interesting, and we're not going to get into it, um, Liz Blackburn actually has a really nice seminar talking about the discovery of telomerases and the telomerase RNA and how they figured out this process. Um, very rightly won a Nobel Prize for doing this um, and is, does really amazing work. So now we'll go to the other end. Uh, you've figured out how to deal with telomeres. If you're smart, you're E. coli, you don't bother, you just have a circular chromosome. Um, but you still have to start somewhere. And where you start is what's called the origin of replication. So in the case of E. coli, that's called ori C which is the chromosomal or cellular start of replication. What is the origin? It's where you have a DNA sequence, which is where you have all of the replication initiation factors that bind. Now, I haven't really talked too much about this yet, but factors is sort of what molecular biologists call proteins. Um, it's a silly naming procedure, but they you know, call these, these things factors instead. So replication initiation protein, replication initiation factors, uh, they're used completely interchangeably. Um, sort of in RFC and RPA, for instance, when we talked about the eukaryotic replication fork. Replication factor or replication protein, either of them. So binding site for these DNA binding proteins, they're specific DNA binding proteins. And then once you have binding to the replication fork, then you have bidirectional replication. When I say bidirectional replication, that means you have a, li a leading strand going this way and a leading strand going that way, and of course a lagging strand at the same time. This replication fork will progress, one going this way, one going that way, until they get to the end. And when they get to the end, then what actually happens is you have two circular chromosomes that are attached to each other in something that's called a catenane, so two interlinked circles. How can a cell deal with two interlinked circles? So DNA. 
Topo isomerase 2, exactly. So you absolutely require a topo isomerase 2. This is something you can't do with a topo isomerase 1. But topo isomerase 2 is required to then separate these two rings relative to each other. Um, but nonetheless, you also are going to be pulling these strands apart. And as we remember, that you know, the number of base pairs in the E. coli genome is on the order of 5 million, 10 bases per turn. It's actually slightly negatively supercoiled. Uh, so you end up having to have, on the order of 450,000 supercoils you have to deal with. And so you really, really need to have topoisomerase, not just at the end, but also when you're undergoing replication. And it turns out the topoisomerases are actually really good targets for antibacterial drugs. So a number of antibiotics actually will bind to and inhibit the topoisomerases of some of the bacteria. So it's a really nice drug target um, as well. So what does this look like if we zoom into the, let's see if we can actually get this now to advance, um, <clears throat> the actual origin sequence itself. Um, this is a very general process here where you have your origin of replication, which is here, this green sequence in your DNA, then an initiator protein which binds to this sequence, and right next to it is sequence which is easily melted, i.e. you can pull those two strands apart relatively easily, and if you're negatively supercoiled that helps as well because it's easier for those two strands to come apart. After you have the two strands that come apart, then you put on the DNA helicase. And this seems to be the really critical part of any kind of replicational initiation is putting on that helicase. Because once you have the helicase on, it's going to start to pull the two strands apart. Once you have single-stranded DNA, you'll have single-stranded DNA binding protein, but also DNA primase can come, bind to that, make an RNA primer, allow you to extend the DNA. But that helicase activity getting the helicase activity and getting the helicase onto the DNA really seems to be the critical step of starting replication to take place. So you have DNA binding of these initiator protein, denaturation, which is pulling the strands apart, and then getting extra proteins to come and originally form or eventually form this replication fork. So what's this look like for E. coli? You have ridiculously creatively named DNA A, B, and C. Um, DNA A binds to the replication origin and gets the helicase associated with the DNA. That's DNA B. DNA C will put on the sliding clamp that you will need for the polymerase to extend. But that real key first step is just getting the helicase onto the DNA. Once this has happened, primase can bind, you can have your extension, here will be a leading strand, lagging strand, all of this is associated together. In the case of eukaryotes, this is called the origin recognition complex, nothing to do with Lord of the Rings, um, so origin recognition complex. So, but first I want to talk a little bit about one of the other problems that you have with DNA, um, particularly for starting replication. And that is, once you've started replication at one particular position, you don't want to start there again until you've gone through the whole cell cycle or you've separated your chromosomes relative to each other. So the cell has to have a way of knowing what has been replicated and what hasn't been replicated. So the first of these is what happens in E. coli. In E. coli, the DNA is methylated. And we talked about this when we talked about restriction endonucleases. Way back when we talked about DNA techniques. Restriction endonucleases seem to have evolved to protect cellular DNA from viral DNA. That's what the restriction endonuclease does. It chops up the incoming viral DNA. It chops up the internal viral DNA, but not the cellular DNA because the cellular DNA is methylated. 
So protection against these restriction nucleases, but also methylation of DNA is a way that the cell knows that this origin of replication hasn't been used. So if you have both strands that are methylated, it hasn't been used. As soon as you start replication, you're going to be adding new nucleotide triphosphates. That DNA will not be methylated yet. So for a relatively short period of time after you have initiation, these will be hemimethylated DNA. So one strand will be methylated, the other strand will not. And so this basically says to the rest of the cellular machinery, hey, I've just started replicating here. There's no point in starting replicating here again until it gets methylated, and at which point you can start undergoing this process again. This is great, works really well if you methylate your DNA and use that as a control mechanism. Eukaryotes don't do this. They have a separate way of doing this. So that's sort of at the bottom here. And this is kind of a combination slide, unfortunately, that talks about, sorry, licensing. I should have mentioned what I meant by licensing. So licensing says this is an origin of replication that you want to use. So in E. coli has to do with methylation um, and hemimethylation saying, hey, this one's already been used. In the case of eukaryotes, it's a bit of a different story. And it actually is com connected to the process of initiator binding and recruitment and unwinding of the DNA. So what happens in eukaryotes is you also have origins. Now, eukaryotic DNA polymerases, probably partly because they need to replicate through nucleosome-bound DNA, are really kind of wimpy. They're actually about 10 times slower than bacterial polymerases. And eukaryotic genomes, for the most part, and certainly true in our genome, are way bigger than microbial genomes. So you have a wimpy polymerase that's 10 times slower, and you have a way bigger genome that you need to replicate. How do you deal with this? You have multiple origins of replication. So you don't have just one origin of replication like you have in E. coli or EC. You have many, many, many origins of replication. Now, this makes that issue of not trying to replicate at the same place multiple times even more important. So, but in general, same process happens. So our orc, you know, Saruman's orcs, no. The um, origin recognition complex binds to multiple different origins in a chromosome. Then it also associates with these other fun little proteins with names that basically mean absolutely nothing, CDC6 and CDT1. So CDC6, anything that's CD that's associated with it, is cell division cycle. These were all discovered by yeast geneticists who looked for mutants that had problems with cell division. So that's where all of these things end up coming from. CDC6, CDT1, cell division cycle, cell division timing in these two cases. So if you're mutated in these genes, you have problems with cell division. And in this case, it's problems with cell division that you have problems with replication. So CDC6 and CDT1 bind to DNA that is associated with this orc recognition, the origin recognition complex. And then you have the replicative helicase, MCM, that associates with the DNA. All of this is not ready to replicate because the helicase hasn't actually been turned on. The strands have not been separated yet. Strands aren't separated. You can't have DNA primase. You can't undergo replication. What has to happen? What happens here is because we have cell cycle control in eukaryotic cells, lots of cell cycling has to do with phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, particularly cyclin-dependent kinases. So what's a kinase? It puts phosphates on proteins. Cyclins go up and down in the cell cycle. So cyclin-dependent kinases phosphorylate CDC6 as soon as CDC6 is phosphorylated, what happens with phosphorylation? You change the structure. You change the other proteins that that protein is interacting with. 
So in this case, it's now removed from this pre-replicative complex. Once it's been removed, now the helicase can pull apart the used strands. You get wonderful replication. Also, these cyclin-dependent kinases will phosphorylate the origin recognition complex. Why is this important? Because if you have a phosphorylated origin recognition complex, it can't bind to CDC6 and CDT1, and you can't get the helicase that's associated with it. So this phosphorylation is kind of serving like that hemimethylation that you have in E. coli by saying, hey, go away. Don't replicate here. We've just replicated here. So also a, a process of, of licensing in terms of getting your, your DNA replication and making sure that that origin of replication is used once and only once in any given cell cycle, any given replication cycle. Okay. Yeah? You said the phosphorylation Okay, so there's two phosphorylations that happen here. There's the phosphorylation that happens on CDC6, which allows the MCM helicase to go, and it's actually a different kinase, which phosphorylates the ORC, which now says you can't associate with CDC6 anymore. So there's two different steps of phosphorylation there that are important. Other questions on this? So um, that's all I want to talk about in terms of DNA replication. There's, of course, whole courses you can take on DNA replication. Uh, Dr. Courcell here in the biology department actually works a lot on replication. So if you're interested in DNA replication, particularly in E. coli, and he's now working in yeast as well, um, you can go and ask him questions about it. But um, we've, I think, pretty much done replication, as much replication as we're going to talk about. OK, so let's move on, talk about DNA repair. Um, I mentioned before, um, DNA is a pretty crummy molecule to use as your genetic information. And one of the reasons that that's the case is that pretty much all parts of DNA can be chemically modified. You can modify bases, you can modify phosphates, you can modify riboses. Any of those things can be chemically modified. And since the genetic information is coming from the interactions between molecules, and that they're all in the appropriate orientation, any kind of chemical change can be a real problem in terms of that information transfer. So any of these chemical changes can be a major problem. Once you have a chemical change that changes that genetic information, if it doesn't get fixed, that can actually be passed on during replication to future cells. And it turns out that for cancer, this is a very important aspect, is that mutations happen and they get inherited. Other things that can happen with mutations, they can block replication. So if you're trying to replicate your DNA, if you put in, change the nucleotide, change the structure of DNA, then the DNA polymerases can't get through there. Can, they can disrupt transcription. You can't make RNA anymore properly. And sometimes these mutations will lead to cancer, aging, et cetera. So mutations are generally bad. And these mutations are happening as soon as you have a change which changes the genetic information. So DNA is a really crummy molecule for your genetic information with one sort of real saving grace. And that is you got two copies. So if there's something that happens over here, hopefully what's happened over it's not the same thing as happened on the other side. So having that redundancy, the two different strands having complementary and redundant information probably is sort of the, the saving grace of DNA and probably why it's been maintained over billions of years of evolution as the cellular genetic material. Of course, a few mutations are good because if we didn't have mutations, we wouldn't have evolution and we'd all still be slime or viruses, as the case may be. So one indication that these mutations are really important for cancer is there are many, and this should be inherited human diseases, that have problems with DNA repair machinery. So 
These are a whole bunch of different names here that I don't expect you to remember. The one you might think about is xeroderma pigmatosum. Xeroderma pigmatosum is a disease where people who have mutations in these genes have very high rates of skin cancer um, and UV sensitivity, um, defective in all kinds of repair mechanisms, in this case, the nucleotide excision repair mechanism. But one thing to just get out of this table, again, not all these names, but cancer, 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 leukemia, cancer, 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 leukemia, etc. So all of these are associated with the DNA repair machinery. So from a cancer biology point of view, this is a, a very important process. So what are some of the things that can happen to DNA? Uh, Ionizing radiation, um, clearly a very bad thing, unless you're actually trying to treat cancer. So one of the things that cancer does is these are cells that are replicating out of control. Well, if you can break all of the DNA in those cells, then potentially you can use this as a treatment. So radiation oncology, that's exactly what radiation oncology does, uses ionizing radiation to try and break up DNA. But in general, uh, you want to avoid ionizing radiation because it breaks backbones. And as we'll see a little bit later on, um, it actually often causes double-stranded breaks, which are a big problem because you can't deal with redundancy anymore. Chemical base modification. There is a vast amount of changes that happen to our DNA, particularly in terms of cytosines they lose their amide groups. And this, you know, the, the numbers here are sort of per cell per day. Um, deamination happens really rapidly. Even more rapidly is what happens is depurination. So literally, the purine groups fall off of the riboses in your backbones. And why do these things happen? They happen because we happen to like it warm with oxygen. And these are just and aqueous environments. So just the fact that we are at 37 degrees most of the time, um, and we're in a nice aqueous environment means that deamination and depurination happen. We also like light on the outside, and actually the sun's come out today. Um, UV irradiation causes lots of DNA damage as well, particularly the case of pyrimidine dimers. And we'll look at each of these in more detail later on. But the three big problems, and actually I should put four here with water as well, heat, oxygen, and light. Just that these things are around means that we have all kinds of changes that happen to our DNA. So once we have these changes, what kinds of mutations can they lead to? There's sort of two basic kinds of mutations that can happen, so-called transitions and transversions. Um, somebody asked me online what this single letter code refers to. Um, so Y represents pyrimidines. So this will be cytosines and thymidines. Rs are purines, so adenines and guanines. So anytime you have a transition, that means an A is changed to a G or a T is changed to a C. Now, this process, you know, A to G and T to C, these are actually pretty minimal changes because if you think about the double-stranded structure of DNA, Watson and Crick base pairing works because it's always a purine with a pyrimidine. So anytime you have a change of a purine to a purine or a pyrimidine to pyrimidine, there's not going to be that much change that actually happens in general in the DNA structure. On the other hand, if you take a purine and change it to pyrimidine or pyrimidine and change it to purine, that's going to be a much, much, much bigger difference. And so those are things which the cell is much more likely to notice. And that process is usually going to be repaired by something called mismatch repair. So while well, that mismatch repair does, and we'll see how the process works this rate probably on Friday, um, recognizes that you have mismatched base pairs, and then will repair the one which has been changed. And we'll see how that's detected in just a second. Another way of looking at these DNA damages, again, it's about water, it's about oxidative damage, some extent to methylation, but it's really the main thing is about water here. The arrows in this diagram represent 
the frequency of these kinds of changes, chemical changes to the DNA. Big blue arrow here, blue is water, and a blue arrow here. These guys, depurination, cleave the gly uh, glycosidic bond between the ribose and the base, between the ribose and the base. Deamination of cytosine, cleaving off this amide group from cytosines. You also have oxidative damage, and this is again because we like living in oxygen. Um, probably the most common of these is oxoguanine, 8-oxoguanine that happens here, but you can also get oxidation of the ribose ring structure. You're going to get oxidation of any of the double bonds in any of these bases as well. Methylation. Methylation is less common as DNA damage, but as we just saw in E. coli, it's actually really important for marking different parts of the genome. When we talk about DNA silencing later on, we'll also see that DNA methylation happens a lot. Another way of looking at that is here. Deamination and <clears throat> depurination happen. Again, this is over here. Deamination, loss of this amide group from cytosine. Depurination, this little arrow here is supposed to represent your riboses. End up with an OH here. And then, we haven't talked about yet, are these pyrimidine dimers, um, also form as cyclobutane rings. And this is any pyrimidine. Most people talk about thymidine dimers, where you've got two thymidines right next to each other in the sequence. This can be two cytosines. It can be cytosines and thymines. Doesn't really matter. But what happens in this case is you have this ring structure that forms. And this ring can only happen when the nucleotides are right on top of each other. And as we all remember from our DNA structure, um, they're not straight on top of each other every base you're turning one-tenth of a circle. So if these guys have made a cyclobutane dimer between the two of them, they've lined these two up on top of each other. And this causes a big change in the structure of DNA. And it's that change in structure which is really going to be recognized. You may notice a big red circle down here at the bottom, at least if you're not sitting right in the front row. Uh, this is probably one of the most problematic changes that happens in DNA. I mentioned methylation. Uh, methylation also happens for important reasons like shutting down transcription, um, also in E. coli for seeing that you have already modified your DNA. If you have deamination of 5-methylcytosine, the problem with this is you end up with a completely normal nucleotide, thymidine, afterwards. All the other changes here are weird. So cytosine deamination gives you uracil. Uracil isn't supposed to be in DNA. Deamination of 5-methylcytosine gives you thymidine, which is a real issue. Um, could you maybe uh, close the door here, please? Could you close the door? Thanks. So yet another way of looking at this, common, muta common changes. Deamination of cytosine gives you uracil. Guanine hydrolysis gives you a depurinated sugar. And you have your cyclobutane dimers here. So how do we deal with this? Multiple different ways. The smart way to deal with thymidine dimers is something called photoreactivation. Photoreactivation is great because there's a protein called photolyase that binds to pyrimidine dimers. And in the presence of UV light, reverses them, gives you back your unbound pyrimidine dimers. Unfortunately, somehow in the evolution of mammals, we lost this activity. So we don't have this particular activity, the DNA photolyase activity. Um, but the fact that there are organisms that have this and actually quite well spread out through all of cellular life um, tells us that this is a very common kind of damage that takes place, and not surprisingly, we have this um, mechanism for repairing it. Mismatch repair, we kind of mentioned this a little bit when we talked about replication, polymerization, looking at base pair stacking, one mistake in 10 to the 5, your 3 prime to 5 prime proofreading exonuclease gives you two. Mismatch repair fills in the last of these. So how do we learn about mismatch repair? The first way was actually a lot like how people discovered those genes that were important for 
replication in eukaryotic cells, cell division cycle, problems in cell division cycle. These are mutations that were found in E. coli. If you have mutations in these genes, you have very high rates of mutation. We eventually found that some of these are important in DNA repair, particularly mismatch repair. So what happens in mismatch repair? You have bases that don't bear, pair with each other. This is recognized by the structure of the DNA. So particularly got a transversion, you know, purines, purines, pyrimidines, pyrimidines. That's going to be a problem. But even just a AC base pair, that will be recognized by these proteins, particularly what's known as the mute S protein. The mute L protein basically says, OK, I'm going to figure out which strand I want to get rid of. So if you think about mismatches, this is where the polymerase is put in the wrong nucleotide. It's important that you repair the strand which is just being made as opposed to the strand which was already made. And here, methylation comes to the rescue in E. coli. Non-methylated strands get chopped up by the mute H protein. You have a nick. Here you're going to make a nick in the DNA. This DNA is removed. Eukaryotic cells don't have methylated DNA, so there's got to be another way to figure this out. The way that this seems to happen in eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells often have these holes in their DNA, and that's because the DNA ligase hasn't got around to fixing them after it's gotten rid of the primers. And as I mentioned before, DNA polymerases in eukaryotes are real wimps. They're very slow, and so they make relatively short pieces. Um, so those short pieces, the short Okazaki fragments, then give you lots of nicks that can be repaired later. We'll talk more about other kinds of repair on Friday.